Koto, Kenato Koto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto Kato. Thanks for inviting me to your beautiful uh, town of, of Wellington. I hope uh, that I won't be one of Ron's professors with attitude, so if you're worried about that, just pretend, pretend that I can drop the, uh, the prof label. I want to introduce you to three people. The first one is Jack. I met Jack when Jack was 18. This is a picture of a 13-year-old boy who also happens to be uh, my nephew, one of my nephews, with my puppy. Um, Jack's uh, story started when he was a little kid. He lived with a single mother and an abusive stepfather. When Jack was this age, when Jack was 13, Jack decided that he was safer living on the streets, homeless, than he was in his own home because of the abuse that he'd been experiencing. He went to the streets, he couch surfed for a while with friends, he tried to stay at school. He managed to stay at school for almost the next two years, but you can imagine his literacy and numeracy outcomes were terrible. And before he turned 15, he dropped out. When Jack turned 17, he decided he wanted to turn his life around. He wanted something different. He wanted something better for himself and his future, and he really desperately wanted a job. And Jack decided that to do that, he needed somewhere to live, and he decided he'd go and find his father. So Jack turned up on his father's doorstep. Uh, unlike, you know, many kids in Jack's situation, he managed to track down his dad, and he said, Dad, I need somewhere to live. I need to turn my life around. I need a new job. Jack's dad said to him, well, I've got a new family now. You can't stay in the house. You can stay in the caravan out the front. And I'm going to pick up Jack's story again in a little while. This is May. May's two and a half years of age. She lives in one of the most disadvantaged suburbs in Australia. Uh, her mother is unemployed. We know, even though May is only two and a half, that in all likelihood, the outcomes for May that we can predict now for her future are dropping out of school early, so low educational attainment, likely to be unemployed, likely to be living in poverty, and to repeat that intergenerationally. Finally, this is Catherine. Catherine's 21 years of age. She has a physical disability. Catherine's just completed a university degree, so he's well educated uh, and is currently unemployed and looking for a job. Catherine's family lives in a rural area in Australia, quite some uh, place away from the city that she's living in where she studied and where she's looking for employment. These are just three examples of case studies of people's lives. And we know in Australia and in New Zealand, I've had a look at all of your stats, we have quite similar complex social issues. We have high levels of mental health problems and disability, and that also usually means that you're in a situation where you are more likely to be socially and economically excluded. We both are in countries that have higher levels of homelessness than is actually realistically acceptable. We have gaps between our Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. New Zealand fares better in some areas than Australia does, but we certainly still have huge gaps in terms of our incarceration rates and our health rates, for example. We have increases in poverty rates in both countries, and if you look at the Gini coefficients, which basically means the gap between the richest and the poorest, both of our countries are not doing well. We have high levels of youth unemployment, and place-based disadvantage. And we can add the numbers to that. The questions that these social problems leave me with are these. What if we lived in an era where our policy decisions, our services, our organisations were driven by using evidence more effectively? What might we achieve and what are the risks that we actually need to worry about if we focused on outcomes? What changes might we actually see for our kids, our families, our communities, our people like Jack, Catherine, May? I think that it's easy to see, and you're all in this room and you're probably all committed to it because you're here and because of the work you do, there's a strong case for social change. But actually, there's also a sustainability drive that other people might be uh, interested in, particularly people like policymakers. We've seen significant shifts in terms of the sector in relation to funding. And Ron talked about the uh, pay for success sort of model. But we've also seen 
the big introduction of social impact investment. We've seen that internationally at the GO8. We heard your minister this morning talk about social investment here in New Zealand. Um, it's happening a lot in uh, Treasury departments in Australia at a state level and then also federally. Um, and actually, if you start to dig into other areas, this notion of payment by outcomes or outcomes focused decision making is becoming more prevalent in all sorts of conversations and funding um, examples. Finally, I think we're seeing a shift in terms of the social services sector. And we're moving almost a little bit more to a market forces model. I don't know if that language is being used in New Zealand um, much, but it's becoming more and more prevalent in Australia. And one of the classic examples is our national disability insurance uh, scheme, which I'll talk to you a bit in a, in a little while. But in terms of the market forces idea, it's basically just the, the, the elevator pitch is that markets will provide services for those in need when we give them the money. And the examples of that are health, private health care, private age care, and we're seeing it with the National Disability Insurance Scheme in terms of uh, giving people money with disabilities to then pay out for their services. If you're the holder of that cash, what you do with that cash, um, you need to understand what services, if all of you are service providers and I have a small finite amount of money, what is it that I'm going to get from your service? And what outcomes can you tell me you're going to deliver to me or help me get there? Um, and how do you demonstrate those outcomes? So in this sea of possibility of where I can spend my money, you can be a point of difference. So I think that the sector is shifting to a space where we have no choice but to move to think about this outcomes notion. But if we're really serious about social change, I think the starting point has to go back to what type of problem are we trying to solve? There are three types of problems. This is a simple version. Linear problems, they have cause and effect. Do A, B happens, easy. There are complicated, and a linear example is, you know, you pour pollution into a drain, we get polluted water cause and effect. There are complicated problems. Complicated problems are trickier problems. They require a heap of skills, a heap of effort, a heap of experience, um, and trial and failure to get right and to solve. And an example of a complicated problem is sending a rocket uh, ship up in space. Thirdly, we have complex problems. And these are the complex social problems of the examples that I started with and the ones that you'd all be well familiar with. I think the easiest way to start to conceptualise and think about complex problems is to think about them in terms of systems. How many of you are familiar with systems thinking? Ah, oh, then uh, maybe we could swap places and someone else can do this. I'm going to give you the one-on-one -on -one for those of you who didn't have your um, hands up. Be patient with the rest of the room. The, um, Systems thinking has sort of four pieces to it. This is the, you know, you can read textbooks on this, but this is the 101 version. There are independent parts that play different roles in a system. Those parts are interconnected, so they work together. And when those parts work together, our whole is bigger than the sum of the parts. The really important thing about systems is they have feedback loops. And I think if you remember nothing else from systems thinking but they have feedback loops, it's quite useful. How many of you have been in a supermarket with kids and there's lollies on display and the kid desperately wants the lollies? So if the kid cries and carries on enough, um, you know, you can hold steady for so long but occasionally you just go, enough already, I'm just going to give in. There's a classic example of feedback loops. Kid cries, parent, support, whoever, aunt, buys the lollies. And, uh, and then it reinforces that the supermarket should place the lollies as low-hanging fruit for more kids to cry and carry on. It's a feedback loop example. The other one that's classically used in terms of system thinking are things like reef systems. This is a fish tank in our house that my husband um, looks after. I get to just look at it. It's beautiful. But a reef system is a classic example where we have independent parts we have parts that are interconnected that work together and we have feedback loops. If we change one part in that system, I can crash the whole tank by stuffing up the feeding, by changing the temperature, by changing the water flow. 
People also live within systems. They live within systems that look something like this. The complex problems that they experience also exist within systems. The way we think about those complex problems, the way we solve them and how we address them also sit within the system. And the goals that we have around our aspiration for people's lives also fit within that system. So if complex social problems and people sit within systems and the solutions and the aspirations that we have for people fit within systems, why do we so often have siloed approaches where we deal with one aspect in one of these little circles? And I want to go back to Jack and to May and to Catherine and play out what these examples might look like in terms of the systems that people live in. Let's start with Jack. So we know that Jack's aspiration is to become employed. The other thing that we know about Jack is Jack has a mental health problem. He has an alcohol and a drug problem. He has terrible social skills and remember he has poor literacy and numeracy. One of the government policy interventions, and I'm going to give you examples of positives and negatives here. Somebody asked in Ron's question and answer thing around negative examples. I've got a few for you. We know from a policy intervention that punitive measures like cutting social security, like um, increasing mutual obligations with the assumption that youth unemployment is an attitude problem do not work for most of our young people. They obviously don't work for someone like Jack. Jack, uh, when he decided he wanted to turn his life around and had housing, went off to one of Australia's job service providers. The Australian government, one of the big policy shifts um, that lasted for quite a long time was funding these private job service providers. And this was payment by outcomes. Basically what happened was you became a, a service provider, the government gave you money if you could say you delivered a job. So Jack turns up to one of these service providers and they say, yeah, sure, Jack, we can help you get a job. They sit Jack down, they help him write a resume, they help him with interview skills, they brief him, they prep him up. Jack goes off, has an interview with a service station, he gets the job. How long do you think that job lasted for? It, it, less than two weeks, somewhere between a week and two weeks. And, and it's pretty obvious to most of us if we think about Jack's situation that that jo job isn't going to last. So this, the evidence for that job network was that yes, they ticked the box, they got their money, they got Jack a job, but the job did not last. And the job didn't last because it didn't address the system that Jack was in and the complex problems that he was experiencing. Let's try attempt number three, and he obviously had a lot more um, contact with the service system, but I'm just giving you some examples. Jack ends up at Australia's Headspace. This is different to your Headspace, but similar premise. It's around supporting youth with mental health problems, but it's a holistic approach to providing services for young people around their outcomes and their well-being. Headspace provides Jack with the mental health support he needs, it provides him with trusted adults in his life. It provides him with new networks to all sorts of um, actual referral type supports, housing, education, training, employment providers, stepwise things, alcohol and other drug type supports. It basically is an integrated service that touches into all of these levels. Um, and I've actually just finished, evalu we've evaluated Headspace twice. We've just finished a second evaluation. I'm waiting for the ministerial release. I've been told this week that it's out, so I'm happy to talk about Headspace in general, but we can't talk about its findings just yet. Um, I don't have time to talk about this now, but I might come back in question time for someone that's interested in mental health to give you another evidence example of a housing and accommodation support initiative for people with severe mental illness. Let's move on to Catherine. Remember, Catherine was looking for work and she's unemployed. Now, there is also in Australia a disability employment service provider arm that's funded by government, not funded by payment by outcomes, but funded in general. 
Catherine's chance of getting a job, and this is what we know from the evidence, is about one in four if she uses one of these disability employment service providers. She has a one in four chance of ending up with employment even though she's a highly educated woman. She has a one in five chance of keeping that job after 26 weeks. The policy intervention of the employment service alone is not going to fix the structural problem that we have in Australia where people with disabilities are still excluded from mainstream employment for all sorts of reasons. So what else might need to be considered? The National Disability Insurance Scheme, which I referred to earlier, is Australia's latest biggest initiative around individualised funding. It provides, um, it's an ins insurance scheme, it provides individual funding based on a certain um, eligibility criteria to people with disability and the idea is someone like Catherine will get whatever money it is that they decide that she's eligible for and Catherine can then make choices as to where she wants to spend that money. The idea is to increase choice and control and to achieve social and economic uh, outcomes based on what people need and want. Now, the thing about the NDIS is the NDIS also alone is not going to automatically create jobs for somebody like Catherine. We know as an insurance scheme, something like this, and with any kind of policy intervention, we have to understand access. How do people access it? What supports do they need to access it? In Catherine's situation, she's highly educated, so she, she will have the skills to access this employment scheme. But we know people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. We know people with, um, from our Indigenous populations with disability, people who are incarcerated with disabilities will have far more challenge accessing, experience far more challenges accessing the NDIS. So we think Catherine can tick the access box. Um, we talked about the job situation. The other thing about understanding complex problems in systems is one of the other policy initiatives that the federal government's brought in in the last couple of years is decreasing the social security payments for people with disabilities. So even though Catherine has the NDIS, all of a sudden she has less access to money. The other problem that we have, if we start to think systemically as opposed to looking at one piece of evidence over here, is that the national rental affordability scheme that Catherine was using to get money to help her stay in an urban area that increased her, increased her chance for employment has been axed. So all of a sudden, despite this situation where we've got this great promise of something like the NDIS for Catherine, which I, I am an advocate for, someone like Catherine is at risk of having to move back to a rural area with her family because she can no longer afford to live in the city location that she's based. Classic example of a feedback loop and the unintended consequences from using systems thinking. Finally, let's look at May. So remember, May is a young kid. She's got um, uh, poor developmental outcomes. She lives living in place-based disadvantage. We can predict her educational outcomes. We know what helps. There's plenty of evidence in the early childhood space. Many of you will know it um, around the importance of education, early intervention, of loving and safe families, of early intervention in terms of healthcare, et cetera, et cetera. We have heaps of knowledge around the early childhood space of what works for um, kids and families. But some kids, irrespective of having universal healthcare and intervention, still fall through the gaps. One of the things that we've learned in terms of using evidence effectively is that collaboration and good collaboration can matter enormously. We know from uh, the Stronger Families and Community Strategy evaluation that use quasi-experimental design, so a randomised control trial type version, that a place-based intervention in a disadvantaged community can work when you have effective partnerships and those partnerships happen under certain conditions. One of the other um, things that I think is really important with place-based disadvantage that sometimes gets forgotten, not by people uh, necessarily in this room, but in general, is this issue around material deprivation. And I found some of your stats in your child poverty uh, monitor. And actually, one of the challenges with deprivation is if you, if you don't have any food before you go to school, it's very hard to learn. If there's no um, money for heating, 
you know, we have ongoing sort of social problems and often, you know, um, one of our policy interventions and an evidence-based interventions that people use all the time is something, just pulling out an example, like financial literacy. Let's take financial literacy. If I give you $10 to spend, I can give you as much financial literacy training in the world and it's got the best high quality of evidence. But if you've only got 10 bucks to spend and you've got to pay for electricity and feed your kids, you've still only got 10 bucks to spend. I want to give you an example now of uh, an intervention that the evidence showed failed and people then made a decision to change things. So Gordon Care was, is an Australian-based um, organisation. It did a number of things, but one of the things it did was provide residential care for kids that were particularly vulnerable or at risk from abuse, etc. Gordon Care has existed for, I can't remember, maybe 30 years or something like that. What they found over that time period is intergenerational cycles. So they get one group of kids in and then the next generation, they would see their children cycle back through Gordon Care. It didn't mean that the day-to-day -day support Gordon Care wasn't doing wasn't useful. But if we think about long-term outcomes and changing kids' lives, it wasn't doing what it intended. As a result, the board decided, they took the money and they decided they would invest, they would take all of their assets, they would set up an endowment and a philanthropic fund and they created the 1020 Foundation. And the 1020 Foundation is now using that money to invest in place-based disadvantage in an initiative called Opportunity Child in Australia that aims to decrease early childhood vulnerability for about 65,000 kids and it's using a collaborative, place-based um, approach. Okay, so I've given you sort of three examples with a bunch of evidence-based examples of things that have and haven't worked within. And I'm a really big, strong advocate for outcomes-based, um, you know, using outcomes to drive evidence. But there are some risks that we need to think about and I think the risks are really important in embarking on this big shift towards outcomes measurement. We have to be really careful around the costs and benefits piece and Ron pointed to this in his paper as well. There are some really uh, ordinary examples of social return on investment where the costs and or the benefits are not rigorous. Um, and all of a sudden we're making claims like for every dollar invested we get five dollars return or for every dollar invested we get two dollars return but actually the rigour that sits behind the assumptions from an economics perspective is so poor that actually it's not demonstrating anything and I think that um, in some cases we've seen examples where big policy decisions have been made off the back of um, poor quality evidence. I think we have to be careful when we don't think systemically and we don't consider the unintended consequences of what we do and those three case studies should hopefully help play that out. I think we have to be really careful that we don't get so distracted by outcomes that we fail to recognise the importance of process. The how of what we do. The collaboration piece we know matters but actually you can have rubbish partnerships. You can spend, we could spend all day in a room talking to each other and make no progress whatsoever. So the how of what we do things matters enormously. And, uh, and I know that the focus um, here is a lot still on evaluation. And I think don't lose sight of the process side of evaluation. We have to be careful with this notion of establishment versus implementation. And this is really pointing to a timing period. So actually, you can have an initiative that we evaluate that might be in 10 different locations. Let's say, for example, we find that in five of those locations, that initiative failed. Maybe it's because in five of those locations, the establishment period was too quick. Maybe the implementation of that was really poor. Maybe it's not the model that's broken. Or maybe it is. But we need the ability to tell the difference between the two. So if we're getting poor outcomes, is it because the intervention or the idea or the policy is bad? Or is it because the implementation of it could, could have been better? We need to understand the two. The importance of intermediaries. 
I think one of the risks that we see around this funding by outcomes or a potential risk is, is that all of a sudden there'll be no money for the intermediaries. And by intermediaries, I'm just going to go back to one of my concentric circles. If we're looking at an intervention where you've got multiple uh, layers of the concentric circles being addressed, you need people who can do the referral pathways. Who's going to do the active um, referring? Who's going to be the broker between sectors? Who's going to talk between the not-for-profits, the governments, the service providers, negotiate with business? Who's going to connect up kids to mentors, et cetera, et cetera? There has to be intermediaries or we know that the um, complex responses can't necessarily be addressed. Number four, I think we have to be careful with this assumption that the market will provide. Government sort of theory, and there's a heap of work on this from a sociological and a political um, point of view, will show us that governments fill the holes that when market fails. Government fills holes when market fails. So we have to be careful, therefore, to then move into a notion where we have market forces and we make assumptions that the market is always going to fill the gaps. So there is a risk in that scenario around losing niche providers. So, for example, if you're a provider that has particular expertise in a particular area, say, say supporting a person with a particular type of complex disability, and it costs a lot of money to support that um, individual group, then actually if we set up just a market forces system without adequately funding, we, we have a big risk of that niche provider actually not being around into the future because it's hard for them to be sustainable. If we have the private space stepping in, and we're seeing that increasingly in health, disability, aged care, um, and they will continue to play a role, and we have to make sure that works in terms of outcomes. But we have to, and as a result of that, we're seeing mergers and acquisitions. So we're seeing small not-for-profits grouping, we're seeing um, for-profit providers bring on not-for-profits, all of those kind of things are happening. We have to be careful we don't lose, lose our niche providers and our hardest to reach don't fall through the cracks. Finally, and I won't go on to this um, in too much detail, we have to be really careful about poor quality evidence. And I, even though I'm not going to spend too much time on that, it's really critical. And I guess the two main points I want to make about this is, one, everybody knows what good quality evidence looks like. Lucky you, you have organisations like Piru who provide you with all sorts of support resources to understand that. Um, but the other point that I want to make is I think we need to start to shift to shared measurement. If we don't, if we take lots of individual evaluations, and I still support individual evaluations, but if you've all got different programs, you've all got different evaluations, there's like 200 and, I don't know, 30 people here. If we've got 230 evaluation reports, can we possibly compare our outcomes for all of our programs? Usually not, because we're using different outcomes to measure different things. We have to be cleverer at using shared measurement. Okay, I've been given the wrap up, and I'm at the end. So, so what? So what does this last half an hour mean for what you go away and think about and do next? Here's some ideas. One, go away and work out what problems you're trying to solve. Two, think and work systemically. What does a system look like that you're actually working in? Can you map that system? What are the levers? What are the feedback loops? What are the unintended consequences? What's your role in that system? We all have a role in that system, even if we're the researchers. Collaboration is critical when it's relevant, but we don't just collaborate for the sake of collaboration, and sometimes that worries me. Um, we wrote this little A5 accessible booklet called The Travel Companion on collaboration that you might want to download for free if you're interested. So think about who can I or should I be partnering with and under what circumstances and conditions might that need to be occurring. I think we have no choice but to work within the competitive market. And it's not something that um, the social sector always likes to hear or talk about, but we almost have no choice. If the ministers are talking about social investment, jump on the bandwagon and start talking about social investment. It doesn't change what we're trying to do. We're trying to create positive outcomes for people that are vulnerable. We're trying to create better kids, better families, better communities. Uh, and we can, we can still point to that and evidence for what we do and how we do that. 
um, and layer on the language of social investment. Um, understanding the funding mechanisms that are available and those concepts or drivers that are creating change is, is really important. Uh, finally, measure what matters for the people who matter. Measure what matters for the people who matter. It's a really simple statement, but if you remember nothing else but measuring evidence that matters for the people that are the key stakeholders, then that's a useful thing. And the people who matter are not just the vulnerable client groups, because if we can't get funding, then we can't serve them, for example. So think about what matters for the people who matter. Use evidence that's of high quality to inform, keep, change. And I think as part of this, we have to be prepared to fail and correct. Um, that's it. I do think, despite my sort of level of urgency and horror about some of the negative examples, if we start to think systemically and we start to use evidence for um, social good, we can generate, you know, enormous change. <laughs>